asking people to do the right thing because it's the right thing, even though it's harder. Those days never were here. We need to think of more ways that we can take cost of doing business, spend, the admin or even the grudge spend that we're already spending on stuff indiscriminately. And we need to find ways that are easy and free and rewarding to make that spend matter. Welcome to the Backcountry Marketing Podcast by Portside Productions. Today, I'm sitting down with Brad Stevenson. He is the CEO of Premiums for the Planet. Brad, welcome to the show. Thanks, Cole. Happy to be here. I'm excited to talk to you. Yeah, I'm excited to dig in. We're going to kind of break the mold a little bit. Um, I think when most people think of marketing, they don't think of insurance. But we're going to be talking about insurance. And we're going to we're gonna talk about how, in your case, insurance, uh, you're actually in a very unique position because a lot of the work that you're doing in the insurance in industry has a lot of crossover into the marketing industry as well. And so not to mention you're up to a great cause um, and really shaking up things. So Brad, I'm curious, uh, when, when did you realize that you were actually in the marketing industry and not the insurance industry? Let's, let's start there and then we'll kind of uh, give people a background on, on what premiums for the planet is. Yeah, no, thanks for the question. And, uh, and again, honored to be here. And the outdoor industry has actually been a, a pretty strong first mover, pioneer, and a lot of groundbreaking climate-related stuff. And it's been no different with us. So just, again, we'll shout out to the industry that you're serving and, and the pioneering adventurous people who are willing to take the important steps to make the differences that they always seem to be first to make. So, uh, so yeah, I mean, the when you, you call it marketing, uh, I call it movement building. And that's probably an important distinction for how we view the world and what we think of when we think about creating awareness, uh, because we really exist for a cause. And uh, to some extent, the cause that we exist to serve um, is uh, a, a more comprehensive view of, of what is uh, success, right? And, and uh, so from a marketing perspective, what we're really looking to do is awareness, um, the impossible but actually exciting and uh, motivating task of making insurance sexy and actually creating passion around insurance and something that people, uh, when they understand and they see the role of insurance you know, in our work in, in its relationship to climate and social justice, they can't unsee it and it becomes... Uh, you know, a passion of theirs to understand how we're going to harness that that power. So, you know, for us, marketing is movement building, education, uh, engagement, activation, maybe some overlapping terms, but uh, just our vocabulary is different. And it's a constant reminder for why we exist and that uh, our reason to engage is is definitely not a single bottom line reason. We have to be financially sustainable, but we literally exist to drive system change and the status quo of insurance to harness that significant power to drive systems change um, and a uh, healthier, more habitable, uh, socially just planet. I was reading an article, I couldn't tell you when, a couple of years ago, and it was talking about you know, ways that the individual can be climate or environmentally conscious. And, you know, the number one thing on that list, the, the top thing out of out of all the things you could decide to do to change your lifestyle was deciding where you put your money, um, the bank in which you put your money or the credit cards that you use, uh, because because the because that that funds everything. And I'm curious if you can kind of share a little bit of behind the scenes of what is premiums for the planet? Um, how do you use that same idea, but apply it to insurance? Kind of what's the elevator pitch? Uh, what do you guys do? Sure. I mean, we exist to harness the power of insurance and insurers to be a force for a regenerative, just habitable planet. Um, what's behind that is, is big. So we're essentially collective action for insurance. We organize uh, the insurance spend and the the voice, the influence, the 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 uh, brand power of organizations that are climate conscious and social conscious, uh, social justice conscious, into a market force that we can then use to shift the demand dynamics for the insurance carrier landscape to use collective action and the community's collective spend and influence 
to not just uh, achieve better economics for our community, but also uh, negotiate changes of standards and practices and behaviors associated with the insurance carriers and how they impact either positively or negatively the trajectory of uh, climate change and social justice status quo. I guess as the name implies, premiums for the planet, you, you, you take the premiums from, from businesses and choose insurance carriers that are more socially or environmentally conscious. Is that how it works? Yeah, that's a part of it. I'd say that's an, and the end goal is the, the critical mass to be able to harness that community power to withdraw support in a meaningful stick kind of way from laggard insurance carriers that aren't moving or um, being progressive in their concerns and their influence toward climate change and social justice and move that support toward leaders to accelerate their uh, journeys in sustainability and ultimately to create a race to the top where insurance carriers now are competing uh, for a huge community volume of dollars and brand endorsement by being the most progressive, the greatest sustainability leaders, the ones that stand behind protecting the outdoor places and the, the people who, who uh, we need increasingly inclusively to be visiting. So yeah, that is for sure. And you know, what we essentially do is in the insurance value chain, you have the insured that buys insurance, you have an insurance brokerage concept in the middle that helps the insurance buyer and places those insurance policies with insurance carriers. And what we wanted to do was find a way that we could harness the everyday administrative cost, uh, in this case, insurance, and deploy that sort of that cost that right now is indiscriminately placed because it's a grudge spend, right? I mean, it's the kind of thing that we spend as little time as we have to dealing with. And, uh, you know, it's a very substitutable service and, and product. It's very commoditized and very mature industry. So we took something familiar, which was the, the brokerage role, uh, repurposed it toward activism and uh, are able to use that same familiar concept, which is, as I said, very substitutable to take the brokerage of record of organizations that are purposeful and mission driven around climate and social justice by merely changing their broker of record uh, to be within one of our, our brokerage network partners. We then have purview and fiduciary oversight of their spend and they become simultaneously a member of a climate action community that's badged just like a 1% for the planet or protect our winners or conservation ones that stands for this system change with insurance. And so in, in sort of that one simple act that costs nothing, takes no different, no additional effort, is not a different business process than what they are already doing, it takes the money they already spend anyway and will spend anyway on insurance and gives it mission alignment and impact and becomes a brand asset of value that they can now use in their uh, community ethos and brand identity as a, an, another really thought leading climate action that they can take and it ultimately didn't cost anything. It was very simple to do. I mean, how big is the pot of insurance money? Like how much, what could change if that money was redirected? What, what's the scope of this, of this industry potential? Yeah, so I'll I'll kind of go down in in altitude from the top at the fifty thousand foot, the top of the peak view. We're seeing like seven trillion dollars by one source is the global insurance spend marketplace. Seven trillion dollars annually in just the U.S. In just the insurances that we would call commercial insurance, which are things like when organizations buy real estate or property insurance when they buy liability or cyber insurance or uh, what they call property and casualty, not including health and benefits, which is massive in its own accord, but just those organizational spends on those property and casualty type coverages, $922 billion per year that we're sending insurance companies and insurance, those insurance carriers, they make, uh, they make their money by taking those funds that we're sending them are, are premiums, insurance premiums, and investing those in something that makes more of a return than they're paying out in claims. And we we hope that they're paying our claims. Sometimes that doesn't happen. And you know, that's in a way, you know, it's an industry that can sometimes uh, love to be hated. But, uh, you know, so 
it's it's a huge amount of money that we're sending them and that they're then deploying uh, in ways that I think would surprise most of us. So as of, I think it was 2019, the industry had $582 billion invested in fossil fuels. Uh, 90 billion of that was still in coal. And uh, you know they continue to invest in and continue to ensure those kinds of activities and projects, which frankly, it's one thing to be the second largest money manager on the planet, which insurance carries far collectively, but even more compellingly, they're deciding whether they will or won't insure things uh, like new fossil fuel projects, and they're deciding how they insure things. And those terms uh, determine whether something is investable, fundable, or not in, in operable from any source of, of funds. So if without insurance, you, you can't fund it, you can't operate it. And so that's a pretty big, pretty big lever they have to pull and uh, that, that currently is used in ways that we, uh, for most of our outdoor industry, um, you know, organizations, we'd say, well, wait, we, we can't be funding that. We can't be supporting organizations that are undermining the things that we and our, our customer bases and our stakeholders fundamentally care about. The amount of money that a, that a company, an outdoor company, would spend on insurance premiums does that, in a in a traditional sense, if they weren't working with you, like does that uh, negate all of the the good that they're trying to do, whether it's through sustainable products or through um, you know nonprofit partnerships and and cause marketing efforts? Like, does it is it is it a wash um, because you consider where where the brand and the company is is putting their money? Yeah, so uh, a few answers. You know, first, I don't want to be that mean. Uh, to, to, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, one of our our partner organizations uh, is an organization called Topo, and they've recently started doing work around the impact of your money in a fossil heavy bank. And you know, they published something in the in the I think it was the New Yorker, New York Times. It, um, it was a with Bill McKibben. That basically evaluated that your your money, if you're Google, your money sitting in the bank is many, many times more impactful and detrimental than all of the other uh, all of the other sustainability actions you're taking combined. And while you know one of the things that we need to drive from an insurance perspective is greater disclosure, the ability to actually have the data to measure and have these metrics and, and provide that kind of that kind of metric, um, the common sense of it is, uh, you know, a- absolutely. We're talking about the industry that probably has more influence on the direction of a market economy than any other, because, it, like I said, if you can't insure something, you can't raise funds for it and you can't operate it. So, I feel like it's really two sides. Uh, one is the money that we're sending them. Uh, and what the carbon footprint is if they're investing it heavily in fossil fuels. The other is just the the values alignment, the organizational practices that we're enabling associated with how they are using insurance and what practices they're proliferating or using their pressure to transition. Um, it's it's a big deal. Um, so the other analogy I would tell you is hmm. philanthropically organizations, you know, do do what they can, and just to to, to give an example that's concrete. If if a company has twenty thousand dollars that they're deploying philanthropically to a nonprofit that maybe is working to change something, call it insurance, because that's what we're talking about today. Um, if a company were aware of that, on the other side, that company, same one, might be spending two million dollars a year on insurance, and so it's it's kind of like. When we look at the cost of doing business spend that most of us spend on a day-to-day basis and the actual damage that it's unwittingly doing when it's not values aligned versus the 20000 that we're specifically deploying to you know, the nonprofit of our choice to overturn what the $2 million is doing unwittingly, that's kind of the, that's the analogy. It's like when a physical therapist tells you, Look, you can do all the exercises you want, but if you're sitting at your computer with bad posture 10 hours a day, you're not going to outdo that with an hour of, you know, of these exercises. 
Is there enough data to determine like what what one dollar of insurance spend equates to in terms of like CO2? Is there a number there that you're aware of? Not that I'm aware of. You know, part of our mission will be to establish those kinds of uh, being able to get the data to come up with the methodology to deliver that sort of metric. But at this moment, it's I'm not aware that it exists. Yeah, it just that seems like that'd be a really fascinating correlation, and I mean that would be a, that'd be a great story for you guys to run with if if you could if you could find that information. Certainly on a roadmap. <laughs> so I mean, it, it seems like this is kind of a slam dunk. Like, has no one else tried to do this? Is this like the first? Is this the first attempt at making insurance sexy and like making it you know stand for more than just coverage and and risk prevention? My knowledge, it is. It's the first attempt at uh, activism in insurance or collective action around insurance, and the first platform that truly stands to drive change and drive it in the way that we we envision it. So, yeah, I mean, we're really about moving the cheese, and in a sense, um, you know, we both partner with the insurance industry in that, you know, we work with some of the existing constructs and existing players in the space. Uh, and at the same time, it's what we're doing is disruptive. And so there's a, a delicate balance of, of how we collaborate. You know, we've been told by some of the insurance carriers that we approach, uh, they've actually been really relieved uh, to, to see us show up. I mean, in one sense, we're, we're activists and we are, you know, shining light on things that are happening from an insurance industry perspective that I'm sure folks aren't happy about. On the other side, and a lot of other modes of action, they're being pressured to just give things up, right? So stop insuring fossil fuels, stop, you know, doing this or stop taking that revenue. And what we're doing um, has a carrot potential as well. It's kind of, we're asking you to give some things up. We're asking you to change business practices, but we're organizing a, a, a very lucrative, very attractive community of clients that we would like to be able to move toward those that are willing to lead. And so it's giving something back for what we're asking. So it's, it is a, a balance, uh, but no, there's nothing else like this that I'm aware of. And uh, it's really an overlooked, uh, a very overlooked opportunity. I would call it a lever hidden in plain sight. Um, one other example that I think organizations don't think about is uh, conservation and the protection of public lands. Organizations working toward those outcomes sometimes don't recognize that on the other side of that pipeline or that drilling project or whatever it is that's uh, fighting for the public land lease, there is an insurance policy that makes that possible. And if that insurer weren't backing that project, uh, if our collective action could could help sway the balance of uh, when a project should or shouldn't be insurable, that would be a shortcut to um, to end those battles and win them. So it just as an example of, again, the, the very pervasive, but um, under the radar influence of, the, of insurance. When when did this idea hit you? Were you like in the shower one day and you were like, insurance, like this, this is it. Like, how, how did this, how did this come to be? It was not because I had any interest in my life ever to be in financial services. I would say that, uh, yeah, I, I myself also I never had any passion for this work. You know, I'm, I I live in an outdoor community. I'm about being outside, and uh, you know, the when I when I think of insurance and banking, I don't think of adventure. And so, <laughs> it was uh, it's actually a, a longer story, and I don't know how much of it you want me to get into. But I I had a lifelong friend. Uh, one of my closest friends, business partner for, I don't know, 28, like almost probably 30 years, who uh, was diagnosed with incurable cancer. And he, I know this is random and it, it comes back around, but he um, wanted to make a film around purpose, passion, and perseverance in the context of limited time because uh, he was facing a finite uh, remaining time to live. And in the process of making that film, uh, he, he wanted to do that about a, um, this unexplored, unclimbed peak in the middle of nowhere in the Himalaya. He was a, an explorer. And so we ended up, 
you know, he called me one day and he said, Hey, will you help me make a film? And I said, well, of course, but like neither of us have ever done that and we don't have any money and how are we going to do that? And so it ended up, we raised funds and we went and we shot the film. And when we came back, uh, we were trying to raise money for the post-production and it was kind of a passion project. It was a, a nonprofit we built called Spark Purpose. Uh, ultimately, uh, it was a bank that funded the film because they had an interest in the story of purpose, passion, and perseverance in the context of limited time. And they want us to work with their top 200 uh, leaders around a, a position they were taking in climate change that they thought was going to be uh, not just the right thing to do, but I think they also believed it was going to be good business. And as we were doing this work from that, um, from the perspective of the film, uh, it occurred to me that the way the the bank and the broader landscape of sustainability and banking, uh, that it was a really big opportunity. And so that led to building a movement in sustainability and banking by, again, total accident because of that random chain of events. And when I saw how powerful that work was, well, first of all, when you, when you, what you started us out with, that you've read that there's uh the influence of your money in a bank can outweigh everything else that you're doing. When you see that that's true, and then you see how uh, overlooked that reality is, it's hard to unsee it. And so we started building this movement around banking, and we got major uh, outdoor brands especially to not just move banking relationships, but also to really shout about it and to get out there and say, hey, if, if you're an outdoor industry company and and you're standing for all these great things and you're doing all this good work, but you're banking with X, Y, Z, you're kind of full of shit. You know that at the end of the day, you're, you're outstripping all of your effort. And so that was really powerful for me. And it was the first time I had connected finance and in this case, banking with its influence on the broader stewardship of the places we love and the planet we live on. And um, so again, I also couldn't unsee that. And I actually came to, we did that for about two and a half years and it was really successful and it was really informative and uh, it was really meaningful. And so we took everything that we learned in doing that work, what made it hum, what made it stick, um, the good, the bad, and really deliberately built the premise for the planet model based on that success leveraging those relationships, those strategic templates and, you know, everything that we learned. Um, and I, I hate to do it, but I have to credit COVID with the actual time to sit back and truly launch this and truly, you know, really build it out in a way that was deployable. Hmm. Yeah. You mentioned at the beginning of our conversation, you, you said you see a difference or you distinguish a difference between marketing and movement building. How, how do you define those? Uh, why, why do you see those as different things? So part of it, uh, so I'd say there's part which is vocabulary and I believe in the importance of words. I think that our word choices make a massive difference, whether you're a marketer or a, a, a preacher you know, the, the, or a politician, right? The words that you choose matter a lot. And so one reason I would say is because we don't exist to reinforce the single bottom line capitalism that is created the problem. And, you know, there's a, a part of um, marketing that I think uh, opens eyes, brings new things to life, uh, creates a lot of good. And there's a part of marketing that creates unbridled consumption and the the need to buy more and grow faster and be bigger. And that is unsustainable in, in my view on a planet with finite resources. So I'm careful to choose our language because of what we stand for. And ultimately, we don't exist to sell more stuff. We do exist to create um, the systems change in that area that matters. and. Um, the technology of marketing is amazing, right? Like that's, you know, it's, it's again, that fine balance. Like we need to be great marketers. We need to be incredible brand builders to achieve what we need to as audacious as it is at the scale that it's needed. We need to harness the full power of capitalism and the full power of, of marketing. Uh, 
And at the same time, we're careful to keep in mind, like, what is our end objective? It's, you know, it's more than just the, the money. Um, so the second thing that I feel like makes it really different is, has you ever been involved in like a grassroots marketing or I'm sorry, grassroots, like movement building? No, not, not personally. I mean, I've, I've, I've talked to folks on the show who have been involved or who have started them, but no, not, not directly. So there's some attributes of the way grassroots organizing occurs and movement building occurs that I think are really powerful and are part of how we think about building relationships and defining solutions, uh, having real connection in with members and, and communities. So it's a, it's, it's a bit more organic. It's a bit more uh, relational. Uh, it's, it's more often associated with people coming together around a specific common purpose uh, and a set of values. And so that is at the core, it's fundamental to what we do. And it is, you know, ultimately we're about aligning the power of organizations that share a similar set of values in order to use the combined influence to make change that we all really care about uh, things that are, are beyond the, the layers of just the business outcomes. Uh, so, you know, it, we also really rely on uh, what I call cause partners, like the nonprofit organizations that both join us, as well as have ecosystems of climate conscious organizations in their purview that they help to educate and bring around and, and convene in this conversation. Uh, that's more movement building to me than it is marketing. When we have members that, you know, like Outside Inc. is one of our members and they publish us in, they, they publish their involvement, their membership and premiums for the plan and their annual impact report. You know, to me, that's about education and it's, it's cause driven. And so we depend on that kind of activation and member engagement. And so when I think of people coming together around a cause, engaging, activating, using their, their brand power to educate and share something pers purposeful for the sake of the changing behavior of others, when it's not around buying something that's a typical good or service, then to me, that's movement building. I feel like with every movement, there's a there's a point where it reached kind of an economy of scale and it just it, it takes off like it you you or the team no longer needs to put gas on the fire like it just it takes off on its own. I'm curious, like, have you reached that point? If you haven't reached that point, like how, how do you get there? How do you build enough buzz around this movement? Is it is it just like having conversations like this? Is it having partners publish uh, and, and share the partnership. What are other ways you're trying to grow this movement? So those are two great ones. I mean, we are very early in the journey. Uh, we have accomplished a lot with very, very few resources, uh, and a very, very, very small team. And I think that speaks to the vitality of that movement concept. The idea that with, it's kind of a viral topic of interest. So yes, it's absolutely podcasts like this. And thank you so much for being a part of, of what this is and needs to be. It's absolutely our members uh, publishing in their impact reports or uh, promoting on social. And we do that jointly. You know, As a member, we try to always look for ways to highlight the achievements and the good stewardship of our members. We try to connect them with each other and beneficial business relationships and, you know, you know, their, their services interlock on a set of, set of values. So it's a pretty virtuous community in, in that sense. And so part of what we, um, we will rely on is, is that is, is the, you know, every organization is a center of influence and it's a hub of impact when it believes in something of purpose. And so by engaging organizations that already have established amazing marketing communications assets and channels and champions, and they already have trust with suppliers and consumers and employees. Uh, our view is if we do this right, those partners continue to be a hub of acceleration and organic and viral expansion through 
the work they've already done to have strong brand equity and and relational power in their in their stakeholder landscapes. And and as you do so, like what's the tipping point for insurance carriers to start to notice um, this body of of a collective? Like what's what's that? Is there a number or is there a metric that you need to try to reach to like really start to make change? Well, that's a it's a great question and one as you can imagine we get asked a fair amount. And there are a few layers of the answer. I mean, in in one sense, you know, I would say, you know, people throw out numbers like, well, at $10 million in premium under management, you know, you have the ability to go and form your own special pro- product. And they, you know, I won't go into insurance technicalities, but that's kind of enough that they care. At $100 million, like they take you pretty seriously, and now it's a bucket of money that they would really like to have, and and it kind of goes up from there. So, you know, we could also compare. Um, I'm trying to think of where I saw it. I, I saw a figure recently that the top 12 insurers of fossil fuels make roughly, I think it was 3.6 billion dollars off of um, the fossil fuel insur- insurance that they sell. Um, so that would be another point of reference. If, if that's true, then we would say, well, as we approach from pure financial perspective, the you know three to four billion range, we're now getting into territory of being equally, if not more attractive for reasons I'll explain, than the money that you're making on that side of the house that's brown and that's you know legacy. We have this green future business that's a way better risk going ahead. So that's another way to look at it. But I think it's more than just the dollars. I think when you start to layer in reputational risk and the brand influence of organizations, that's a much smaller number. I think that when when insurers see the kinds of brands that are getting involved and understand the reach from a marketing perspective and a brand equity perspective of of those organizations, all of a sudden, you know, 10 reasonably sized organizations are how many employees and how many consumers out in the world? Like you don't want to mess with that because at a point the stakes get pretty high and, and those organizations, um, you know, ability to, I'd say, uh, make you a villain or a hero. And so I think that the number uh, of dollars, if we look at it super analytically, is probably way higher than the actual tipping point. Of velocity and, and critical mass of some good brands getting on board and signaling that this isn't going away and that there's a lot of potential influence in the room. Um, we've already seen, you know, we've we've had a handful of conversations with some of the insurance carriers that, um, you know, like we look at a rating and ranking and, and try and talk to ones that are right now in the lead. Um, even just existing we've seen them take action to go and do a quick inventory of what, you know, all, all of a sudden it's like, wait, what are we doing in sustainability? Oh, you know, and there's an, an action to go, a project to go and, and find out what we're doing in different parts of the organization and how we're communicating with that and what do we need to do to, you know, to be more streamlined and, and strategic and purposeful. So even in our earliest days, we've seen that that is a reaction which to us tells us we're, this existing is a good on the right track. You mentioned that you guys are trying to build a badge brand, uh, like a 1% a conservation alliance type of a brand. Between where you're at now and where you would like to be in terms of like badge recognition, like where do you think you are on that journey? Um, and how long do you think you have to you're at a spot where people recognize you just as much as they recognize a 1% for the planet? So, I mean, as I was saying, we're, we are early days. At present, we've had literally zero marketing budget communications budget. We've had a super limited team. And uh, so we're at the beginning of the curve. What's inspiring is that uh, the amount of traction, the velocity, and the scale that we already have, and the degree to which um, organizations are leaning in, you know, as we were starting the call, I mentioned uh, being a, a, a really central part of a B lab uh, the the convening body of B Corps that certifies them and and is kind of the umbrella organization across B Corps. We um, have been a a pretty big part of a 
a climate finance educational cohort that they're just launching as a pilot. And it just, I feel like they're that and uh, the climate collaborative around the consumer packaged goods space. It's a nonprofit that works with CPG companies on climate and has a number of members that one percent for the planet protect our winners these uh, organizations that we're working with as well as some of our members are doing a lot to put our brand on the map and what's what's interesting uh, you know i think there are sort of two pieces because what we're doing is at this point completely novel and because when you see what's going on with insurance and how we're trying to address it it's it becomes an attractive story. So we're getting a lot of pickup um, from PR. Like um, we're convening a panel at Greenfin. Uh, we've, uh, we're going to be doing a panel with uh, Climate Collaborative. Uh, Green Biz has written two different articles about our work. And again, this is without outreach. I mean, this is just virally people hearing about what we're doing. Um, and so between that and the way brands are leaning in, um, it's been really interesting. So the, I guess, attractiveness of the, the novelty of the story, uh, has put us on the map. And the other thing I wanted to say that's interesting is our members have outsized impact and an ability to add value to the brand that they're joining, right? In essence, uh, we look to gain more resources and and truly brand build and, and increase the value of what it means to be a member, both in terms of our member programming and the benefits of that, as well as just the value of the badge. Uh, but even today, just our members promoting it and our members our members make it important for themselves and uh, scale it for for the movement we're building. So it's an interesting. A dynamic to be able to work on a cause basis with partners who can help us do this. And uh, I mean, it, looking at your, looking at some of the the companies that you represent that you insure, I mean, you've got, it sounds it looks like you're just at the start of something really incredible. I mean, you mentioned Outside Inc. I think what, uh, I kind of run through the list of, of some of the brands that you guys work sure. with. Sure. I mean, they're, they're, it's humbling. There are a lot, um, one example in a lot of outdoor industry, I mean, the outdoor industry, again, like just, they're just pioneers. They lead when they see something needs to get done, they go and they do it. And it's really cool. And so uh, we have uh, three of the biggest snowboard brands in the world. Uh, Burton, Heidecker, Jones are all with us. And some of our earliest members uh, I mentioned Outside Inc., uh, Peak Design, Sun Ski, 1% for the planet, protect our winners. Sustainable surf, my gosh! Uh, Project Drawdown, Drawdown Fund. Uh, so you know, many more cause partner nonprofits, and uh, we have uh, climate finance brands like Atmos, Enduring Planet, which is a climate finance organization. They they fund impact ventures or help them find funding. Uh, I mean, the list goes on. Uh, we we have a number of them on our website, but at this point, it's just a fraction of them that are there. Well, it's a pretty cool story. Um, and I, and I love, I love what you're doing. I love the Thanks. movement building that you're, you're, you're working on and daily sounds like making great progress. Um, as we, as we wrap things up, what would you want to leave people with in terms of, you know, if people are out there and they've got an idea, um, if they see a lever of their own that they could start to pull, if they're trying to build a movement around a good cause, um, as someone who is actively daily in this right now, um, do you have any advice for him? Yeah, I have some thoughts on that. And uh, actually, though, so before I, I speak, I just want to give a quick shout out to Jeremy Jones, who out of nowhere the other day gave us a big shout out on LinkedIn. And uh, it's people like that that we need just being awesome and caring about things that matter and being willing to, to put themselves out there. So thank you, Jeremy. Um, as it relates to what would I tell other movement builders, which is kind of how I interpret the question, or what would I tell others who are, are trying to embark on a path of impact in collective action, it's um, the, the days of asking people to do the right thing because it's the right thing, even though it's harder uh, or costs more, or you get a little bit less, 
those days never were here. Uh, we're all human and that is not going to fly and it's not going to make the difference we need at the speed and scale that we need it to actually change the trajectory of this thing. So we need to think of more ways that we can take cost of doing business spend, the admin or even the grudge spend that we're all already spending on stuff indiscriminately. And we need to find ways that are easy and free and rewarding uh, to make that spend matter. And the rewarding part really matters because we're all humans. And, you know, ultimately, um, if, if by going through a lot of effort and making a change in something in my organization or my personal life results in having done the right thing that nobody noticed, that's where we need genius of marketing to come in and use that same genius and technology that we have in marketing to deploy it toward these cause-driven behavior changes and activities because nobody knows how to get behavior change better than a really good marketer. Now let's turn that into movement builders and let's keep like what we've built in premiums for the planet and the, the guiding principles of this model are make it easy, make it free, make it better than what exists already so that it's a no-brainer choice for somebody to get on board and uh, and that's how we scale make it make it easy and if we look at things i mean i don't know if i like to use the example but tesla didn't come out to the world and say buy an ev because it's better for the planet they made a cool car and impossible foods didn't come out and say stop eating meat you're destroying the world they said, how about a better tasting hamburger that's healthier for you? And I think that's all we need to think about it. It's, um, it's like the sustainability inside. It's a good story. You know, they, 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 they package their product or their service in a good story. The byproduct of that is it actually does good. That's a, that's a win-win for sure. Brad, I want to thank you for taking the time. If folks want to connect with you, if they have any further questions, if they're looking to change their insurance and they want to, they want to have fun with it. Um, where can they go to find you? Premiumsfortheplanet.com. Uh, you can find me at Brad Stevenson at LinkedIn. Um, and, uh, those are probably the two, the two best ways. Amazing. Well, Brad, thank you again. Um, thanks for sharing, uh, and shedding light into this, this sector of the industry that, I'm sure our marketing community would never have have realized or known what you guys were up to, but it's it's fascinating. Um, I feel like these are these are some of the fun stories that we get to bring to light on a platform like this. And so um, keep up the great work and and let us know uh, how our backcountry community community can help. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. This is amazing. And what I would say to the, to the backcountry marketing community is, if you have any brilliant marketers out there that want to help this audacious uh, challenge of making insurance sexy and, and uh, I, we would love the talent and the help uh, to to really keep expanding and, and using that brilliance for, for this cause. So, Awesome. Well, hope you have a great rest of your day. Thanks. You too. Really appreciate it. Bye. See you. Bye.